Welcome. This campaign cycle has brought forward some central questions about our political life, questions about the role of government and the role of the private sector and our economy and our society, questions about the Democratic Party's core positive message, in addition, of course, to questions about a shift in the center of the Republican Party. At different stages, it's also brought up concerns about the relations between politics and religion and the effects that one is having on the other. What better person to help us think about all of these things than Kathleen Kennedy Townsend? She's a former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, the first woman elected to that office. She was a candidate for governor in that state, and she is currently the chair of American Bridge, an independent political group advancing Democratic Party candidates and causes. She's also a former US Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and her family is, of course, woven into the very fabric of the Democratic Party in the United States and indeed into American politics and American history. A noted commentator and writer about law, politics, and religion, she is the author of Failing America's Faithful, How Today's Churches Are Mixing God with Politics and Losing Their Way. The Campbell Institute is delighted and it's honored to host her talk here this afternoon titled Three Weeks Out, Competing Visions for America. She'll speak for a little bit and then we'll have some time for questions. And before I turn the floor over to Lieutenant Governor Townsend, I want to add that you'll have a second chance to hear her speak here at SU. And tonight she will deliver the inaugural Borgognoni Lecture at 7 p.m. in the Maxwell Auditorium. Lieutenant Governor Townsend, welcome to the Maxwell School. Thank you. Congrats on the pronunciation. Thank you very much. Um, I am thrilled to be with you, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, here. I have to tell you, I've always had a warm place in my heart for Syracuse because you didn't tell them, but as an undergraduate, I went to, um, to Radcliffe, which eventually became Harvard. Um, my mother could never remain the name of the college I went to. <laughs> I know, it's really horrible. She eventually gave me a doormat so I would remember what I went to, but, um, or at least she would. But where I went to college, they, wouldn't, they didn't believe until Larry Summers became became the president that you could learn from anything outside the walls of Harvard University. And I actually wanted to go to Italy and study in Italy. And Syracuse has a terrific campus there. And so when Harvard wouldn't allow me to, Syracuse did. And for that, I'm always grateful. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so it, I, and I used to be able to speak Italian because of Syracuse, but that was many years ago. So I can't. Not anymore, but it was really terrific. You are, you're so lucky to go to this fabulous university that has campuses all over the world. Um, it's really a great, great gift. What I'd like to do today is really, um, I was, we were thinking about what would be the topic and thought two different visions of, of what America is. And as some of you can imagine, I'm on one side of the vision. <laughs> so this is not going to be, I can't pretend this is going to be a balanced a fair and balanced uh, uh, description of what the two visions are, but I thought it would be interesting to at least talk with you, and I see there are students from abroad, and it'll be interesting to see what you think and how you feel about two different visions of really what is the role of government. Um, I think in America, we've always sort of been ambivalent about what the role of government is, and it comes from our very beginnings when we had the Declaration of Independence, which was a fight against government, and we were told that each of us individually had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And at that point, we were really focused on the individual freedom. What happened, as you know, we fought the war, won the war, and then formed what was called the Articles of Confederation, in which everybody was got, got to do their own thing. And that worked for about a couple of years, and it was a disaster. And the founders, George Washington in particular, said, what you can do, you can have a, a rebellion that's about yourself, but you really can't form a country that's only about yourself. And therefore, they had the Constitution in which the words are, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. And the whole idea is that we had to come together to form a government. And they understand that to be free, you need government. You're not going to be free in the wilderness. You're going to be free as a full human being in society. And that really goes back to the ancient Greeks, if any of you that studied Aristotle or Plato recently, um, which I'm sure you probably have, you see that they understand that to be a full human being, you need government to work and to be effective. 
In fact, uh, the Greek word for idiot. Who, who knows that? Did you think I was just going to talk the whole time? <laughs> like you weren't going to have to have any response? We didn't know. know we needed to know Greek. Yeah, you do have to know Greek. No, it's very interesting. The Greek word for idiot is an idios, um, a private person, somebody not engaged in public life. And that came from the notion that you had to be involved and that government was really the way that you became fully human. And really, if you go back, um, you know, nowadays, if you think of the words life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, remember those words? I, I, I used them like two minutes ago. <laughs> so now if you think about what happiness means, most of the time in the United States, if you are, say the word happiness, people think it means money. money. Good guess. Any, anything else that happiness could mean? It's to feel content. Okay, that's, thank you. You had money and contentness. Anybody else want to say what they think happiness is? Success. What? Success. Success. Power. Okay. Power. Small firms. Small firms? Small firms. Small firms. Small firms. Okay. All of those are really interesting answers. But what I think what uh, they meant by the ability to uh, pursue happiness was the ability to get involved in politics. Because you remember, does that surprise you that I would say such a thing? <laughs> because really, if you think about it, they had farms. They could be content. Some of them were very successful. But they didn't have the right to control their own destiny. Remember, the slogan was no tax, not no taxation, but no taxation without representation. If you've gone to see Monticello or Mount Vernon, they, had, they actually had big farms. So the whole notion was that this country was formed on the basis that everybody should have a place to stand, to participate, to get engaged and get involved. Now, not really everyone. Women, remember, despite Abigail Adams saying, remember the women, they weren't involved. And obviously, slaves weren't involved. But we changed it because really, I thought this nation is formed on the basis that everybody should have a role and be able to participate, and that that's where you get your happiness, um, is really being able to control what happens in your life. I'm the oldest of 11 children, and so I'm accustomed to telling my little brothers and sisters what to do. And let me tell you, it doesn't go over well. <laughs> Even if you're right, people want to control their own life and decide for themselves what to do. I have learned painfully over the years. I can also say that as the mother of four children. People want to make their own decisions. So that's our struggle. How do you have a country that, that, that really recognize freedom and the idea that you can have a participate in government or is government the bad thing and tells you what to do? And I would say that's sort of this division between the Democratic and Republican Party, and it's sort of a division all across um, politics in the world. Um, you get from one side, you have no government at all. Somalia, you could argue, had no government. Rwanda, um, and you don't think people there are particularly free. You need a government. Or you could have a government which is really too intrusive, uh, like East Germany, and you saw that when there was a rebellion um, after 1989, uh, they became much freer and much more successful. And so really the question that we have to look at is where do we want to stand? Now, I'll tell you where I want to stand. I come from a family that's been democratic. You knew that. And let me just, I thought I, for those of you who, some of you know my family history really well, and some of you don't know it as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Because one of the things you learn in politics is that why you believe something often comes from your family experience or your own experience. It's often not just an intellectual argument. It really comes out of how you see the world um, and how you think about the world and based on your own experience. So let me just give you a little bit about this. My great-great-grandfathers came over, and mothers, came over from Ireland. They were immigrants, and a lot of them, basically, they were supposed to go to New York, but there was a big storm, and they ended up in Boston. They landed in Boston. They started 
um, in the north end, and they, there were 26 people living in one house with one bathroom. And it was, as you can imagine, it was Irish Catholic. So what was the business? A tavern, a bar. The Irish always ran bars. They got in a little trouble because of that, but <laughs> that's what they did. And they did bars, and then they got involved in politics. And my grandfather, having grown up in Boston, um, because he, you know, 26 people in a house, they didn't have a backyard. And so what his, he was on the Boston City Council, and his first request, and the only thing he was really very successful at, the Boston City Council, was to say we should have parks in the city of Boston because he had played most of his childhood on the streets and he wanted parks. And of course the Republicans on the city council didn't want parks because they had backyards and they saw, saw no reason for parks. And that to me sort of epitomizes the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> Somebody says, you got your own park, work hard, and you'll get your park, you'll get your backyard. And somebody says, eh, some of us aren't so lucky, why don't we have a park for everybody? You're welcome to challenge me on any of my completely ideological statements, okay? I, I just understand that what I'm saying may be offensive to a few of you. And so I, I saw that you laughed at me at that, so I have to take that, I have to take that into account. Anyway, so that's a nice sort of simple difference between them. Then what happened is my, my, uh, my grandfather, Joseph E. Kennedy, grew up in Boston. He, uh, he married the daughter of the mayor of Boston, the, the man who had uh, got the parks passed. But he didn't really like being in Boston because when he was growing up, there were signs, as it were, in many parts of our world and whatever ethnic group you come from, that said, help wanted, no Irish need apply. And there was a lot of discrimination in Boston. Even if, you were, even if you won the mayor's office, you could be successful in politics and be really told by the business community, we don't want you. And so he got out of Boston because there was such discrimination against him and the Irish Catholics, and he moved to New York. And as some of you know, he made a lot of money very successful. He was one of the most successful businessmen in the 20th century. And he always said, I would give half my money back to this country so that the country could go forward. Um, it's better that I have less and that others have more so that we have a good country in which everybody has a role. Got that? Now that is what Democrats believe. <laughs> that's really a different, that's a different philosophy and in fact, I really can't just criticize Republicans on this. A lot of Republicans believe that too at that time. Um, during the Great Depression, for instance, um, J um, Herbert Hoover raised the tax rate for the richest uh, to up to about 80%. When I was growing up, the tax rate in my family was 90%. Do you realize how high that is? I, I, don't, I think I want to let you sink that in, you know, 90%. And now we're, I say that because I wanted to show that there was a different vision of how a country works, that everybody's in this together and the rich pay more because you want everybody to do well. And that was sort of shown not just in the tax rate, uh, it was in the social security that was passed in the New Deal, it was in the Civil Rights Act that was passed when my father was president and in Medicare and in Medicaid. I remember when my father was the United States Senator from New York and we lived, as you can imagine, in a really nice house low, big house. In fact, my mother doubled the size of the house. We had so many kids, 11, it's a lot. It is. I mean, you know, I'm just telling you, it's a lot of kids. <laughs> I guarantee you. Anyway, but, and I remember my father had gone down to Mississippi and he came back because he was doing hunger hearings in Mississippi and he came back to our house and if you walk into our dining room, it's a big dining room, it's sort of big as that part, and there's a crystal chandelier and there's, you know, it's lovely set linen on the table, lovely crystal um, glasses and uh, china and people who made the, you know, we had somebody who made the dinner and somebody who cooked the dinner. I mean, I'm just trying to tell you, it was a nice, nice setup. And I was just happened to have been alone because it was right before dinner. My father walked in and he looked really shaken. And he said, Kathleen, I've just been to Mississippi and I've seen a family that lives in a 
hut the size of this dining room. And the children have distended stomachs uh, because they don't have enough to eat. And they have sores all over their tummies because they had no doctors. And he said to me, do you know how lucky you are? Do you know how lucky you are? Do something for this country. And that wasn't an odd thing for him to say because he often said that. And as my grandfather said it, and my grandmother said it, and they would often quote, as John Kennedy did in his inaugural address, St. Luke, from those who have been given much, much will be expected. And that's what comes out of this whole idea of, you know, that famous quote out of his you know, inauguration, ask not what you can do, for, uh, your, well, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The whole idea, it was, we were together. And I gotta tell you, there was a period of time, as I said, Nick, uh, that, um, you know, Republicans kind of thought that made sense too. Um, the, there was a, you know, you're never gonna believe it, you guys from the Middle East, but we had, because we had this big industrial country, our rivers which catch on fire because they were so polluted. Does everyone remember the river in Cuyahoga County? And it burned. And you think because it burnt once that they passed the Clean Water Act. Well, I did some research on this. It actually had burned 13 times over a period of five years. And nobody paid it, to, maybe it was 10 years. You know, all my stories aren't quite accurate. <laughs> I have to say that because if somebody checks me, oh, that's not wrong. <laughs> but um, it, you know, it burned a lot, and then it was only till people started to say, "We've got a better, we've got to have a better life," that they passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Clean Air Act, both which was passed under Richard Nixon. So even Republicans believe we shouldn't have burning rivers because we want the water for everybody. So that was sort of the philosophy of this country. I would say from about 1932 till about 1980. And what happened in 1980? <laughs> Ronald, Ronald Reagan won. And with Ronald Reagan came in a completely different philosophy of government, right? And where he said, uh, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And I would argue for the last 30 years, um, basically, that's the philosophy that has governed our nation. I mean, there are exceptions here and there, but basically, the thing that is supposed to be great is to get government off your back, get government away from you, be individually strong, individually responsible. Um, there was a philosopher, which I'm sure many of you have now heard of, unfortunately, Anne Rand, who kept thinking it's all about you, the strong individual, nobody telling you what to do. And that has really dominated our politics. And it dominated our politics not just because it's right, far be it from that. It dominated our politics largely because in around 1978, uh, Justice Powell, uh, who was then the head of the, ch he was no longer, he was not the justice then, he was head of the Chamber of Commerce in Richmond, Virginia. And William Simon, who was, uh, I think it was Nixon's Treasury Secretary, got together and said, we have got to get back to capitalism and individual and, and belief that wealth is important and we've got to change the philosophy. And they funded lots of think tanks like AEI and other think tanks around the country. And it was a big change. I I'm telling you this, and I'll just give you my experience. I, as you heard, where I went to Harvard, my class had only three people apply to Harvard Business School. Five years ago, I would say 30% of the class applied to Harvard Business School. So there was a so when I say this to you because it just shows you that philosophies can shift and what is good and what is bad can shift depending on how you see things. And it shifted. And basically what happened is basically people started to say let's deregulate, let's get rid of government, let's shrink government, let's, let, let's and freedom is getting away from government. 
And you saw what happened. Um, it, you know, Clinton, who was a Democrat, deregulated the financial industry. I mean, and he now says he made a mistake. But when a philosophy grabs you, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, it grabs you. And it takes you. And it shapes you, which is just what happened. And so we've had the biggest financial collapse um, uh, since the 1930s, since the Great Depression in uh, 2008. And the country was just in dire straits. And they didn't know what to do. And they were just desperate. And so they would have chosen anybody that didn't be have an R behind their names, because he wasn't Cl Bush. And so they chose Barack Obama. It's almost unbelievable that in any other time, you would have had Barack Hussein Obama elected president of the United States, because it was just so, he came from such a different background. He was African American. And, and who knew that that was going to happen? So it was very exciting. But it came because of the economic collapse. When people ask me why I thought he won, I give lots of credit to um, Hank Paulson. <laughs> who, I do, because he let Lehman Brothers collapse. That was a mistake. That was Hank Paulson's mistake. And he let, it he let it collapse, and then people just lost all faith, and they didn't know what was going on. So now I'm bringing you up to the present day, OK? Did you get that? A little history. I thought that was helpful. Um, where I come from, in case you couldn't guess. So I think in the present day, you've got now two philosophies of, of how we go forward. Um, you have Barack Obama on one side. And I, I said I would talk for a half an hour, so I have a few more minutes. Um, Barack Obama, who believes in government, and he's clear about that. And, he's, and he would go back to the idea of that government makes us free. We are freer when we, are, when we don't have to worry about health care. We are freer when we don't have to worry that our auto industry collapses. We are freer when we don't have to worry about our housing prices. And that's a different view of freedom than the Republicans. But I got to tell you, I just, um, you must have some of your students go to Europe and go to Denmark. My daughter was in Denmark. I have four daughters. Um, and the youngest has just graduated as a senior in college. And she went to Denmark on her exchange. So do you want to hear about Denmark? Obviously, you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> they have free health care. They, they pay the kids to go to college. They have much better upward mobility than does the United States. They have a longer life expense than the United States, and they pay half, in, half the cost in health care than we do. They also pay much higher taxes, and they have been judged, and you don't have to believe this, the happiest, at least Copenhagen, the happiest city in the face of the earth. So that's one vision. Now, Barack Obama is not going to make us Copenhagen because there would be such rebellion, but I'm telling you, it's a pretty good deal. Um, and then you have Mitt Romney who has a different philosophy, which is basically help the rich. And that's what his, I mean, he was, he's going to give tax cuts to the wealthiest uh, Americans. He's going to reduce the taxes for the wealthiest Americans. He's going to, and he, has, and he has said, as you know, I mean, probably regret saying it now, that 47% of Americans um, don't pay income taxes. Isn't that terrible? Um, but if. I actually, because I'm chair of this uh, independent expenditure campaign, you can see what the Republicans say to each other. You, Paul Ryan says 30% of Americans don't work and are just takers. So they have, so their philosophy, it comes out of the sense of what is good and bad. The workers, the builders of the country are those who run the businesses. They're the most important people. They should be rewarded. The rich should be rewarded. And that's what we're going to do, because that's what makes our country strong. Now, I don't believe them. And I'll tell you really why I don't believe them. I don't believe them, because, and I just want you to think about this, and then I'm going to stop, and we can have a discussion. At what point our business leaders really cared about America? They cared about this country. I'm sure, I don't know all the people who endowed 
Syracuse University. But a lot of business leaders did because they wanted Syracuse to be strong. And that's because and if you look at what happened in the 19th century in this country and the and 20th century, at least to the middle of the 20th century, jobs were created in the United States by Americans. Corporations had jobs in the United States and they, and they sold their products to Americans. Their clients, their customers were Americans and their workers were Americans. And that's not the case now. Many of their clients or their customers are abroad. Many of their workers are abroad. I actually said this to Jeffrey uh, Sachs, who's a great economist who helped to uh, save the economy of Peru, and he said, yes, a top CEO of a Fortune 100 country company said to me, it's a little embarrassing, but we really don't care about the United States anymore. Because our constituency is worldwide. Of the 100 largest corporate, uh, largest economic entities, only 50 are nations. The rest are corporations, Apple, Google. And so their loyalty is not going to be to their country because they're all over the world. And so you have a rich class, a wealthy class. One of the biggest donors to the Mitt Romney campaign is a guy called, what is he? God, I can't believe, I can't remember his name. He's such an evil person. That's not really true. I can't say that. That would be wrong. <laughs> Sheldon Adelson. Where does he get his money? In cacao. All his money comes from gambling and cacao, and he's putting all the $100 million in this campaign. Why? Because he wants a $2 billion tax break. Mm -hmm. And George Soros is the biggest contributor to Barack Obama. Where does he get his money from hedge funds? From hedge funds, absolutely, from bet betting so against hedge funds. Is, well, most of them. Although he is betting, he's betting against his interest. He has said taxes should be raised on the rich. Sheldon Adelson hasn't. Yeah, they pay 30, but, and how much of the wealth do they have? Much higher than 39%. Yeah, but I mean, there's a, there's a yeah. Right, tax. right. So the point is. So the question is, is that he, I think what you talked about when you said, uh, what's that name? Kathleen. That's why I said there's a I said we're really we're not Somalia. We're not Rwanda. But where are we? And how and do you care about the country? Because what you can think about is this. You could say, okay, it's the end of the nation state. And so everybody should just take care of themselves. Because it's the end of the nation state. What does it matter that we don't have good airports or good railroads or good highways or good schools? because I can get my work done elsewhere. And, and, that's the Davos, and you know, that's the Davos culture. You feel comfortable with the very few people who can travel all around the world and be in your economic status. Or you could say, which is what I believe obviously, is it really does matter if America thrives and survives. And if you look at history, there was this great article just yesterday in, um, in uh, the New York Times about Venice, which was the, in the 15th century the most vibrant economy going. It was, I mean, have you been to Venice? Yeah. It's totally cool. But it was vibrant, it was rich, it was sailing, it was doing stuff. And then, because it was an open economy and it was letting anybody in and everybody could get in, and then it closed it and it just made it for the few and it collapsed within 200 years. And I have a guy who works with me, um, I actually work in a financial firm with hedge funds, and the um, guy from China says the same thing happened to the Chinese. The rich just wanted to protect themselves and not the whole country. And we never had, right, well the last time we had this sort of, this group on the top was in the, th in the 20s. And the question is, 
do you say to the people, we all participate, why should the richest not pay a higher cent tax rate in order to make sure that we have enough education for everybody else or good enough health care for everybody else so that everybody rises, not just the few. That is my, obviously, you know, that's my view. <laughs> Probably not surprising to many of you. Um, and I think that we've got a really big decision in this campaign between those, I mean, as you say, it's not no government, this is all government, Barack Obama is not asking for East Germany. Mitt Romney is not asking for Somalia. But the question is, what is the best balance? How do you get most people to be free? How do you get the most to be able to control their lives? And I would argue, with good education, with health care for all, with a good transportation system, and with the ability to say that everybody can pay their fair share of taxes, not just um, uh, and that everybody should pay their fair share of taxes. So that's what I hope you agree with me on. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you, you go ahead and ask, you had this particular. different, obviously, uh, center points. But what do you attribute this, you know, steadfastness by both sides, as far as not trying to, you know, compromise and work together? Uh, well, I, I, obviously, I think that the Republican, I mean, obviously, you're going to ask me, why do I think the Republicans don't want to work with Barack Obama? Um, I think because they deeply believe he is evil. I mean, 39% of Republicans in, in um, Ohio don't think that he was born in the United States, don't believe that he has right to be president. So if you think this is a false person, that this is not a real American, you don't think you should deal with him. And I think it's been very, I think the, the demagoguing of Barack Obama, I mean, 39% is a huge number. Um, uh, and I just know the numbers on Ohio, but I'm sure they're higher in other states. So they don't believe that this is a person they should work with. I really think it's sad, but I mean, they think that they're dealing with uh, a non-American who is out to undermine this country and to work with them looks, it used to be when my uncle was in the Senate, Senator Ted Kennedy. You'd have Orrin Hatch stand with him, and you'd have somebody stand with him. I mean, I can't remember all these Republicans. Mitch McConnell would stand with him. You know, It was always cool to, I can walk across the aisle. Now, Republicans don't want to be, have their picture taken with a Democrat because they will be criticized back home for dealing with the devil. And I think we saw that with the decision of Senator Lugar, who was yeah. one of those who lived yeah. Although Luger should have at least um, lived in the state he wanted to represent. That is true. I mean, you know, make a few mistakes. I mean, that's a, that's a, that, that, so I think that's one of the real problems. I mean, I think it's a real problem. Yes. A, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that uh, it, it seems to me that Republicans fail to recognize the cost of severe inequality, because with severe inequality, you can have serious civil unrest, as we saw right. with this crisis. But my question is, why is it that people who are in the lowest uh, economic uh, levels vote against their own interest? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I don't understand that. Well, it's a really wonderful question, because it says to, to, says to me, that all of, despite what Marx thought, which he thought we were all economic beings, we're not. We actually, we want to be, be, you know, we want to believe that we're good, and we want to believe in some sort of um, uh, something larger than ourselves. You know, why did my, my, why did my, my grandfather say he'd pay ninety, you know, he'd, he'd give a half his money away, voluntarily? Because 
there's more to us than economic interest. I really do believe that, and you see that um, uh, among a, a lot of people. So I think the, if you ask why they believe that they, they are very worried about um, abortion, um, oftentimes. Right, but they're worried about uh, abortion, um, and that bothers them, and I think that, that has made a huge difference. There's a, there's a book called, you know, What's Wrong with Kansas, and it really has to do with what the religious right has done uh, on that. Um, so, and then it, then the other thing that is interesting, if you get Mitt Romney, who said something yesterday, which was, I thought, interesting, you don't want to, and this is true with all of us, I mean, it's true with me. I am sure that I don't see things that are in front of me if they don't fit my philosophy. I mean, I just think that's true with human beings, and I don't know why I would be any different. But for instance, Mitt Romney said, nobody dies because they don't have insurance. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost, to, you say that to yourself because you don't want to admit that people need insurance. Um, so that's one of the one of the challenges. Um, one of the challenges. That's why I really believe that more important than, and I wish facts mattered, um, and certainly they should matter. But what it turns out is what we see matters. Our philosophy turn, gets us to see certain things, and if it's it's how we, it's how, our view of the world, and our view of the world is often, I must admit, um, you know our own financial interest can make a difference. Yes? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, this is Ali from Turkey. Uh, I really uh, wonder that uh, there is a big discussion uh, on the media or international arena regarding uh, the, the Barack Obama is Muslim or not. Uh, this is, uh, do you believe that the, uh, this, this, this identity is important or this is the strategy of the Republicans before the election. Could you explain? I couldn't hear you very well. Where's yeah. the, uh, uh, the island? There, there is a big, there is a big discussion. You're from Turkey. Yeah. You're worried about Crete? No. 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 About its ethnicity and being a Muslim, um, does it change anything? Okay. There is a oh. there is an international it, discussion it, uh, about the uh, Barack Obama is Muslim or not. This, this is a strategy of the Republican before the election? Well, sure, a lot of people. I mean, if you're asking, again, I, that was my story about Ohio, that they thought he was a, a you know, he wasn't born in the United States. So there's huge other numbers in other states think he's a Muslim, that he's not. First of all, that shouldn't matter, right? It shouldn't matter. But the fact that, that it does matter to a number of people is very unfortunate. Um, uh, yes? Yeah. He was a Catholic. Yeah. Was a big deal. It was a huge deal. It was a big deal. I mean, a lot of people said, I'm not voting for a Catholic because the Pope is going to rule the United States. You, those are absolutely. In fact, you may not remember know these names, but thank you for bringing that up. There was Billy Graham. How many of you heard of Billy Graham? He wrote a letter with Norman Vincent Peale, who you probably haven't heard of. But, he was, for, he, but no, he was here, actually. Norman Vincent Peale served in Syracuse at a University of Methodist Church. Yeah. Okay, well, we Norman that. Vincent Peale, who wrote one of the most biggest bestsellers called The po Power of Positive Thinking, wrote a letter with Billy Graham saying, don't vote for John Kennedy because he's Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it was, just as you say, there was a huge anti-John Kennedy. And John Kennedy and most Democrats never win the Protestant white vote. They just, they don't trust him. They don't trust, so they, it's, it's, so the, so I think we've come a long way. I, what I think is really interesting about this campaign and, and positive about this campaign is how little has been made of Mitt Romney's Mormonism. Um, and, you know, people used to think that was, a, you know, religion they didn't trust, and yet you now have these, the evangelical Christians who are supporting Mormonism. I mean, for the good of the country, I think it's very, it's a wonderful phenomena. Yes?
there's no recognition that whatever the heck else was going on, he was taxing people with money at a very different, much, much more. I aggressive. think what we really, I think there are two answers. The answer, first, the economists would say, uh, it's not the tax rate that matters, it's reducing the tax rate that matters. So, in other words, the more you reduce it, the better off you are. I mean, it's crazy because you go to zero and there's no taxes. Um, I think the other thing that is really going on, and I think there's this philosophy, and there was this great article in the New Republic about this, that the rich want to be applauded for being rich. Like, you're better and smarter and ter more terrific because you're rich. As though, and so they're better people. You know, the, the fact that Romney could say 47% of Americans don't pay income tax, or that Ryan would say 30% are takers, they're making a moral judgment on who is poor or who's middle class. They're not as worthy as us. And so I think the tax rates have something to do with the economy, but more to do with who we want to pat on the back with a ribbon. And it's a really, it's a different notion because what that philosophy has come up with is we, to be rich is to be wise and smart and better, which was not the philosophy of our founders. I mean, who said small farmers? You did, sir. You, of course, he was quoting Thomas Jefferson, who wanted us to be a nation of small farmers because he thought that as, if we were all small farmers, then you wouldn't have one group more powerful and rich than the other. And, and that, that's, that's why he thought small farmers was happiness because he didn't want one group bigger and better than the other. And that changed. I think that has changed a lot. But, but it doesn't have to. It can change back. Yes, we hope. Yes. be part of the, the, the record of the conversation, so go ahead. Um, how do you gear your action to reaching out to the most conservative and most opinionated Americans? How do I try to reach out yes. to the most? Yeah. Well, it, th there's one, usually, if you ask me as a politician, I wouldn't bother. No. You, you know, basically, when you, when you do politics, I'm not just a talking as a politician, and then, as, and then you can do it a different way. There are two ways to change. As a politician, you have X number of days. And so what you try to do is you try to get your, you turn out the people who like you and get them, you get them to the polls. And the people who you try to, then the middle lean, the people who haven't decided, you try to convince them. But the people who are really conservative, you're not gonna reach and it's a waste of your time. That's the easiest way. Now, as a human being, you have a different view. And so after the campaign is over, I'll give you an example. This is an example from my book. There is, and the best, I mean, the short answer is experience. People sometimes can be touched by experience. Sometimes they can be touched by somebody they trust, they've trusted, who tells them something they didn't believe. That's what the studies have showed. Those are the two ways to get them. It is very unlikely that I personally, in conversation with somebody who's really conservative, will ever be able to touch them. It's just human nature. You can go back to Tolstoy. He has a great quote about that. But um, should I tell you my story? Why not? So there was this minister um, called Rick Warren. You may have heard he wrote The Purpose Driven Life. And he, he for, for many period, 25 years, he believed, well, you probably hadn't heard of it in this first part of his career, that if you had AIDS, you were condemned by God. And you were a sinner, and you were going to go straight to hell. And, and you, you got AIDS because you had sinned. Okay? So that was his philosophy. He had a wife who believed it too. And then one day, there was a picture on the cover of Time magazine of children, babies with AIDS. And she thought, she, and she described this to me because I interviewed the book, and she looked at the picture and she said, oh, 
but they didn't sin. And she put the magazine down because she couldn't understand how this magazine of babies with AIDS fit in with her philosophy, right? So she put it down. And then she looked at it again, and she put it down. And she cried, and she described it took her four hours of trying to deal with her philosophy on one hand and the picture on the other. And finally, she just said, God is telling me something. I've got to reach out to children with AIDS. So for a number of years, she made a real effort to, be, to reach out. And her husband, the great minister, told her, don't you bring any of those people into my church. Don't you have anything to do with that. You're supposed to be a minister's wife. I don't want anything to do with it. OK. So she got it. He didn't, right? Then he wrote this book, book called The Purpose Driven Life. It was like this mega bestseller. It sold about 40 million copies. He became a hero. And people started to come and see him. And he started to travel the world. It's like, actually, it's a wonderful story. And he went to Africa. And he saw kids with AIDS. And he started talking to people who he had never talked to before. And he started seeing a different world because he had never, he had, and I went to, I went to see him because I wanted to interview him. And I said, he gave this, I said, I read your book, The Purpose Driven Life. And it's all about how you got to save your own soul. And I said, well, what about anybody else? Don't you think God cares about somebody else besides just you? It, I kind of said it in a nicer way. <laughs> And uh, he said, you know, and this, he had figured this out before I said it to him. He said, I have to repent. I had never seen the 2,500 passages in the Bible that told me to care about the poor and the sick, the homeless, the helpless, and the immigrant. He said, I just didn't see them. I had grown up in an evangelical community in which we were taught to think about God and me. I was saved by Jesus, and we weren't taught to think about anything else. So I didn't. And Kathleen, by the way, I'm in Orange County, pretty nice. Don't see a lot of poor people around here. So I liked him a lot because he was honest about his own blindness. And I walked out of that meeting saying, what am I blind about? Because you're, I clearly am. I mean, you grow up in a certain way, and you're blind to something. And so I think he's a fabulous person because he he, which is very strange for men, it's my prejudice, <laughs> and for older men, and for successful older men. I mean, you cannot put them together, and they change their mind. <laughs> you have to catch you laughing about something. But, um, and he did. And he did. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story and about how you get people to change their mind, but it is... The easiest way, according to Tolstoy, you can get people to change their mind if they don't feel very strongly about one thing or another. But if they feel strongly, you really need a very powerful experience, which is tough, tough, tough. It's, it's interesting to me as an outside observer that uh, in, the, in the US, the, the, the title of your lecture is about three weeks out from the election. Yeah, yeah. And in the UK, the, the whole election cycle is about three weeks. Right. <laughs> so you guys, you guys take a little bit longer over it. But uh, my question is really about the, um, the, elect the electoral system here. Yeah. And it seems to me that the, the battleground states or the swing states right. is where everyone seems to focus their attention and their money and their message. And I just wondered whether you think that devalues the political campaign and devalues the system because isn't there a danger that candidates just become fixated on what people in Ohio or Nevada think to the detriment of the rest of the country? I mean, because I haven't seen a single campaign ad yet, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Which is true. I, I, I don't know. Do New York, do you see any? Yeah. So you're like us. Congressional. You see congressional. Yeah, so you see congressional. So, um, I, I mean, do I really want to see all those ads? I'm a Democrat. I'm happy. I don't need to see them. Um, uh, I'm not that worried about it, to tell you the truth, because I think people follow the campaign. People, it, it looks like they still vote, even though they know their vote on, that, on the presidential won't be as important. Um, and they do follow, there are a lot of congressional campaigns and Senate campaigns. Um, I think that the system could be better, uh, uh, in a sense, for the, uh, we could have more races that are more competitive, and I think that would be a better si 
situation so we wouldn't have the far right and the far left all the time. I mean, I probably am far farther left, so I'm speaking against my personal political interest. But you know, for the good of the country, I do think it would be make sense for us to be more have more comedy and, as you said so eloquently, try to get along with one another. But it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, but we, and it does matter in the, in the nation's mind if somebody wins the, the, the vote, uh, even if they don't win the Electoral College, so that Al Gore actually beat George Bush by 500,000 votes. People keep remembering that. Not, not George Bush. I mean, he was really pretty impressive. He just took that victory and went his way. But um, I'm not really worried about it. Maybe I should be. I am more worried about the fact that the Congress is so, is so ideological. I mean, I think your point is very, very well taken. And, and it's disturbing. We, we, we should be able to get along with each other better and talk to each other better. And I totally agree with you. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry, I lost my voice. So. Um, my question is about um, uh, why do you think Obama is not able to gain as many uh, young voters as he did in the 2008 campaign, and how do you think that's going to affect his numbers in this upcoming election? Will he be able to grab those numbers elsewhere, or um, in your opinion, what do you think is going to happen? You know, it's always fun to be the challenger. I mean, if you read, it's like the deck, remember I start, I don't know if you were here at the beginning of my talk. You know, the Declaration of Independence, it's so eloquent. You're fighting the good fight. You're going to create the revolution. You're going to do something new that has never happened. Doing <laughs> is a lot of work, and it's not so easy. And if you are in a culture that says get things done easily and get us answers quickly, People get disillusioned, and I think it's unfortunate, but it's the case. That's, I mean, that's just the easiest answer. Um, do I think he's going to make up the, the young vote? No, I don't think he is. I think it's going to be tough. Um, I think it's a, it's a much closer election than it was four years ago, and, and it was, it's a closer election because, number one, we've had a terrible economy. I mean, it's now, you know, finally, we're, you know, we're not creating as many jobs as we need to for everybody to have a job. It's just, that's the facts. Young people know that. They're worried about their future. And the Republicans have huge amounts of money because of Citizens United, as I said. You know, I'm chair of one of these independent expenditure com campaigns, but out of the $407 million that's being spent, 70% is from Republicans. And, I mean, they're just... They can put a lot of money into it. And, you know, money, I mean, it goes to, how, if, if you go to, you know, how, what, how do you believe? You can say, you can find pretty negative things to say about anybody. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's, I think that's the case. And I would also say that when he ran four years ago, he did not make the case that this was going to be an eight-year struggle. Because remember, Lehman didn't collapse until September. So he was running sort of a hope and change when the economy wasn't in such trouble. If he, if he knew what he was getting into, which would have been hard to know for nine months, I think his message would have been, this is not going to be, this is not going to be done in the first year or the second year or even in the first term, but let us begin. Yeah, I know. That's I'm quoting John Kennedy in from his inauguration speech. Because John Kennedy knew that if you're going to try to fight communism, it's going to be a long twilight struggle. It's not going to happen overnight. And Obama didn't, I just don't think he had any idea what he was getting into. And clearly, the economists around him didn't know what they were getting into because they said, you know, do the stimulus and we'll be below 8%. Clearly, they weren't. And they didn't do it, they just didn't know. Yes. Uh, I'm Lima from Jordan. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is based on the famous uh, statement by Kennedy. Don't ask what your country will do to you, but ask what you can do for your country. Yes. 
uh, if you were the president of the United States, what would you do to your country? To my country, mm -hmm. for my country. Or for my country. Well, to your, um, for your country. I mean, I, I think he did a lot. I think getting health care passed is important. I, I mean, I'll just tell you what I think is going to happen, you guys. It's really strange. But we're going to be in really great shape in the next four years. And I don't know how you think about fracking. I don't know what that is. I guess my, you don't like it. But, but a lot of people don't like it. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's going to make America energy independent. And it's going to transform this country in ways that you haven't seen, in ways that, I, 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 my brother disagrees with me, so I just want you to know. Just want, we don't agree on everything in our family. But what we're going to do with fracking we're going to become energy independent, which is going to mean more money, more jobs, so the unemployment rate is going to go down. We're going to have more tax dollars because more jobs, they pay taxes. State government and federal government coffers are going to be richer than they are today. In addition, the balance of payments will be different because our, our dollar is pegged to the cost of oil, and oil will not be as expensive because natural gas will be go up. So we'll will be stronger in that way. And it will also mean, I hope, um, that the Middle East will not be as volatile because the reason it is so volatile now is because it has oil. And if oil becomes less important, people don't have as much to fight over. So I see this as a very positive sign of what's going to happen over the next four years. And if Obama wins, he'll get credit. If he loses, Mitt Romney will get all the credit. It's just kind of, you know, it's the luck of the draw. And, that's, and I think that's really, you ask what's going to happen. I think when we have more money on the, you know, when we're able to spend natural gas, it will be also good to start to deal with the climate change, which is a serious problem, the tornadoes and the, and the heats and the droughts. And, the, um, and so we're going to have to do better energy, alternative energy, as well as we're going to have to do mitigation, put in mitigation measures. I mean, I mentioned Venice. You know what Venice is doing? They have some, it's just incredible. They have something called the Moses Project, <laughs> in which they have this huge um, I think seawall that they can press a button and have it come up and protect Venice against the sea. And it's multi-billion dollar I know, is your mouth open? Yeah, it should be, because it is stunning. But they have money, Venice has money. N not as much as they had in the 18th, 16th century, but they still have a lot through Euro. And so what, if you're gonna be wise, what we need to do is be wise about climate change. The other thing that I think we should be wise about is um, retirement security. We have a huge number of Americans that have no pensions whatsoever. Um, we have defined benefit plans that help those who are lucky enough to have good pensions. We have defined contribution plans that are basically uh, won't protect you necessarily in your old age. And I think we've got to do a lot better with our seniors so they're protected and then we can invest in our young people. I know, I just had to get my fracking story in because I know most of you probably don't agree with me about it, but I thought it was important to get it across, yes. Hi. You have to do it, you should do it well because there's going to be so much money you can do it, you should do it, protect the water. But there really does have a lot of opportunities. Um, so I'm the Christian with the Barack Obama bumper sticker who feels like the rebel when I pull into church and park my car. Um, so I'm wondering why do you think that we don't really have, religious left doesn't even exist. It's the religious right and they have such a pull. Yeah. Um, I think the, I, I did write a book about this. <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I think that what happened basically, it, um, well, a couple things really happened, very smart. After the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, you know, Lyndon Johnson said, the South will go Republican. Remember that? And there was a guy called Richard, and there was a, there was a minister called Jerry Falwell. Have any of you heard of Jerry Falwell? So it, it's a really interesting story. I'm telling you a longer story. It's just bigger to tell you a story. So basically, Jerry Falwell, when Martin Luther King was um, working for civil rights, Jerry Falwell said, 
Ministers should not be involved in politics. <laughs> Terrible idea. Shouldn't get involved in politics. Totally inappropriate. After the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Richard Vigory, who is one of the biggest pollsters from the Republican Party, very smart guy, went to Jerry Falwell and said, listen, we've got to save the country. And I see a great way to save the country. Get involved in politics and build a Christian conservative coalition. And that's what they did. And the Democrats, so that was very smart, and I give them and one of the things they did, which the Republican Party did this. This did not come out of the Southern Baptist movement. The Republican Party decided, and they had a 10-year plan, very interesting. <laughs> People from the Middle East are going to look at me like, what the heck are you talking about, Kathleen? But anyway, so there's a, there's a theory called the inerrancy of the Bible, which says everything in the Bible is right, is true. It's not what the Catholics believe. As you know, Catholics didn't even read the Bible. I mean, my mother was prohibited from reading the Bible when she grew up, so you know it's a d different deal. But if you're a Protestant, you read the Bible, and you were supposed to use some thought when you read it. But the Republican Party said we're going to make the inerrancy of the Bible um, a tenant of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we have a 10-year plan to do that. And they did, and they succeeded. And if you make inerrancy of the Bible a tenant of your faith, that means you reject science. You reject evolution, and you become just very, very conservative. And they figured out to do that through their through the churches. Okay, so that's they were smart. Republicans win many kudos for being smart about how they capture the churches. The Democrats were terrible. <laughs> just I wrote about this in 1980 because I was so mad at them for letting Jerry Falwell take the faith thing, and I said. Democrats, every progressive movement in the United States, with the exception of the feminist of the, 19, of the late of the feminist movement and the gay rights movement, had a, had a religious underpinning. And if you needed to have a pro progressive movement, you needed to have your faith. And they've made a big mistake for deserting it. That's changing now, and I can go into detail how that's changing. But they just deserted it in large part because the intellectuals didn't like Martin Luther King. I mean, now Martin Luther King is a big hero, but there was a period of time where he was considered weak, turning the other cheek. Who wants to turn the other cheek? You should fight black power. And basically, the feminist movement and the gay rights movement came out of that view of anti-faith, because it's too soft and we're going to be tough. I've shortened the history a lot, but <laughs> that's, it, that's it in a short nutshell. Yes. Yeah, there, yeah, that's right. I, I, will t I could talk about it forever, which you will just, like, die. Do you think the economic crisis has pushed both political parties to, like, the furthest left and right? And if you do, what, do you th what circumstances do you think are required to bring them back to the middle? It would be just the economic crisis that split the parties apart. N no, I don't think the economic crisis did. I think, the, I think it came out of faith that really split the parties. What circumstances do you think are necessary to bring the, the parties back to the middle, or closer to the middle? Well, one way would be to change the redistricting situation and have a redistricting done by, um, uh, a non, uh, by uh, an independent group, which is, for instance, what, they do in, what they've done in California under, I, I'm now going to praise my ex-brother, cousin-in-law, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, you know, he was really good to me. He wasn't very good to my cousin, but he was nice to me. No comment, I can see. <laughs> Where is she going to go now? <laughs> um, he basically passed in California, kind of interesting, an independent group that would do the redistricting. And it, Democrats and Republicans, the, the, the runoff would not be between a Democrat and Republican. It would be the two top vote getters. Do you see how that changes it? Mm -hmm. And so there's no need to move left and right. What you're really trying to do is move to the center. So you have, <laughs> you know, it's, it has succeeded now in having two Democratic congressmen coming to fist fights the last debate. So it might not be the best solution. <laughs> but really, you have to change how people get elected and where their base is. And their base now is so different. How do you 
talk about um, the how do you talk to Republicans about this idea that um, small government is state run? Because it seems to me that things would get a lot bigger if every state has to decide on every issue and policy. The state government can grow a lot bigger. Yeah. So talk to about the concept of big, small government. I think it's a false, I don't think they really care. I mean, what do I think they really care about? I think they care about their tax breaks. I mean, when, when Cheney got in and they put up, look, if they really cared about government, this is what they did under the Bush administration. They started two wars and they passed a huge increase in the Medicare benefit, right? And they didn't pay for it. They didn't raise taxes, they just borrowed it. So they were happy to increase the cost of government and they did a tax cut. So I think this idea about, that it's about government, I really don't think. Malarkey. Malarkey, you said it. I know, I started off my talk by saying this is about, but I really think that if they really cared about government, I mean, if you really cared about the debt, you'd tax the rich and say, get rid of, help get rid of the debt. And you tax other people too. You'd say, our country matters. We all pay taxes. Do you think everyone pay taxes? I, I think most people do pay taxes. You know, they, they pay social security taxes. For instance. Well, if you're, if you're below a certain level, you get a check from the government. You're a zeroed income credit. Right. Do I think it's better if there's a way that everybody feels they pay taxes? Yes. Do I think that would be good? Yes, because I think everybody should feel that they have a stake. And I think taxes are one way. But everybody does pay taxes. They all pay in um, sales tax. I mean, everybody does, in fact, pay sales tax. They pay. And that goes to the state government. I'm talking about the federal government. The federal government. Right. The state government. Right. But you pay gasoline taxes. You pay, and they yeah. sound their federal government. I mean, you can you could come up with a fairer system, but like, I, do you know? I bet many of you don't know this. The Social Security tax, you know, it's a percentage. If you make over one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year, you stop paying Social Security tax. It's, it continues to pay the one point four five Medicare tax. You wait, no limit. yeah. But in other words, you could have a more, which I think you're right about. You could have a much more transparent and fair tax system. And I th would I, do I think that's a good idea? Yes, I think that's a good idea. We'll get the next one. Yeah. What? Well, we're just uh, we're, going, we're taking turns here. Oh, okay. Right. Just a comment before I ask my question. I really think the Republicans are sucked in by a sublim subliminal reality, which is this that. When bad times come, if you have cash, like business people, Republicans, money people, if bad times come, you have a negative incentive because your money is worth more unless you really turn down with the economy. You, in other words, you have more incentive to, let, to not do anything when things go bad because your money has more power when things are going down. Yeah, well, I, That's subliminal. I don't think it's something well, that it's people not kind intentionally... Of happening. I, that might be true if you had a tight money policy from the Fed, but we don't have a tight money policy from the Fed. So the Fed is, you know, loosening the dollars. So a lot of people who are saving money, particularly seniors, aren't as happy about what's going on. There's a balance, there's, I mean, I can get into this, but do you want me to? No. <laughs> Basically, we now have a very, very loose money policy from, the, Fed, from the, um, uh, the Federal Reserve under Ber Ber Bernanke. So he is, you could argue, and many people do, that he's hurting creditors and he is hurting seniors who have you know, re uh, reduced income. And his view is, but we've got to help young people get jobs. And so that's his argument. And you know, there's a, there's a good argument that way. Okay. There, there was more a comment on, on that discussion, but my question is really, how do you philosophically justify the huge number of people who are on food stamps? And, and I'm saying that, having seen as 12 years an organic farmer, 
the erosion, both the lack of uptake of people willing to spend more organically. It's like 1% of people are regular organic yeah. buyers. And the need for farmers who have unseen work, and I really believe this, their work is totally discounted because it's not even the imagination of people. It's all on how much does five pounds of potatoes cost, not the life of farmers. How, I, I've got these two contrasting things, which is how do you give away food and then say farmers ought to have a better life? Because, you know, they're not going to get money if, the, if the, the, the pressure is always on the downward pressure of, of lower cost food. Like it should be 10% of our money, right? It shouldn't be 10.7% of our expenses. It's got to be 10% of our expenses. Okay. Farmers in the United States are, are usually, I mean, I don't know about you, sir. Uh, clearly, you're talking about your own personal experience. But on the whole, most farmers um, in the United States produced enormous amounts of food with very few people because of fertilizer and because of our farm equipment. I mean, the United States is so by far the most effective farming country in the world. We are blow away amazing. And it was, in fact, food stamps was supported by Robert Dole, a Republican senator from Kansas, because he saw it as a place that the farmers' products could go. So he loved food stamps. I know that is not an answer for you, but I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get another question. I, I really, you know what? Yeah, they're probably about six. Yeah, well, I, I, I know. Only 10% yeah. are the ones producing massive amounts. Right. Like 90% of the farmers are not in that equation. You know, I got to tell you something. I'm going to just tell you. One of the things that, you know, oftentimes <laughs> politicians aren't honest. And not, that's not true. They're not, um, they don't say difficult things to their constituents. That's not the same as not being honest. And I was, this is about a senator who I just thought was so terrific. I was on, I used to be chair of the platform committee for the Democratic Party. And we had a meeting in Missouri with Senator Durbin. And there were about 20 people in the audience, just like yourself, sir, who said, we need to help farmers. And you had the head of the teachers union saying, we need to help farmers. And you had Kathleen say, yes, we need to help farmers. I had no idea what I was talking about. And Senator Durbin, who actually, represents Illinois said, you know what? The world is changing farmers. And you got to get into a different business because that's what's the life. <laughs> so I've always remembered that. I thought it was so cool. Kind of a, <laughs> yeah. um, if both of Hillary yeah. would have been, uh, would have made it yeah. uh, four years ago, would she, uh, would we, we be having those conversations right now? I think so. Because as Bill Clinton said, and Kudos to Bill Clinton. He said nobody could have gotten us out of that economic downturn. When you have a financial downturn, it is as bad as it can be. Nobody's going to get you out. Nobody could have done a better job. Um, now, I think we could have done a slightly better job if we had allowed us to spend more money on um, infrastructure and hired people, because I'm a Keynesian. But uh, you know, basically, it was hell. I mean, look at Europe. It's bad everywhere. The only places that were doing well were the emerging markets, and, and they're growing. But they were not as touched by this. So I don't think Hillary would have done as. I mean, she might have at the edges. She may have done something differently. She's been around more. She, but I mean, they used Hillary Clinton. I mean, Hillary. Uh, who did Barack Obama use? Larry Summers. He was in the Clinton administration. Tim Gardner in the Clinton administration. I mean, he surrounded himself with all the Clintonites. I was a Clinton supporter, so I think she's fabulous. But I think when you have an economic downturn of the type Barack we had, such a new person. I think that I think that was a challenge. Yeah, one yes, I was going to ask. Um, you talked about Citizens United as like uh, right. how the Republicans. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I was wondering what you make of the voter ID laws that all those states have put into place. Oh, yeah, because you're saying Republicans yeah. just yeah. care about. Yeah. Money. It is basically Jim Crow. I mean, it is, it is, they, this is Republicans trying to get Democrats not to vote. Uh, it, it's pretty blatant. They've actually said such things. 
and, uh, and interesting in court after court, they've been turned down. But, you know, they're really smart. They thought ahead. When I talked to people who were Republicans who when they first heard this said, you've got to be kidding, this is terrible. And kudos to them. So, you know, you've got it. What this shows to me, and not that I need it, philosophy matters, your story matters, your vision matters, and you really got to work on it because if you believe something deeply as a way to shape something, it, it can be compelling. So, I really enjoyed being with each of you. Thank you so much, and thanks for doing this. Um, this is really important, most important. Go out to vote. Of course, vote Democratic. Get all your friends to vote Democratic, and make sure that we have a good philosophy in which we're all in this together. Thank you very much.